Good morning, I'm Alison Rose, the principal of Newnham College, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this morning's Newnham in Conversation, part of this year's Cambridge University Alumna Festival. And the subject is engineering. My father was an engineer in car design, so I grew up with anxieties about whether retractable headlamps would actually retract, whether crumple zones would meet safety tests, and his lifelong chagrin that being known as Rusty Rose because of a rather unfortunate problem with the early Triumph Herald. Then when I became British Ambassador to Belgium and was involved in promoting UK trade and investment, I was struck by how often the firms I visited said that their biggest need was engineers. And I was also amazed by just the sheer variety of tasks that they needed engineers for, whether that was working with medics to shrink the enormous machines needed to deliver proton therapy for cancer patients, or whether it was designing bespoke a uh, food engineering plant for Lotus Biscoff biscuits, you know, those ubiquitous little gingerbread biscuits you get at conferences or on aeroplanes. And it really did make me think, um, where I must enthuse young people just about the, the exciting possibilities of engineering. So I'm delighted that we've got Newnham's, two of Newnham's fellows are in engineering with us this morning to talk about engineering. Dr. Claire Barlow and Dr. Sakthi Selva Kumaran one a sustainability and materials engineer and the other a civil engineer are going to let us eavesdrop on their conversation this morning. Claire has been a fellow of Newnham since 1980 and until recently was deputy head of engineering in the university engineering department with particular responsibility for teaching. Sakthi is the Isaac Newton Trust research fellow at Newnham and was listed in the Financial Times top 100 most influential women in UK engineering in 2020. Claire and Sakthi, over to you. Good, thank you, Alison. So it's a, it's a great pleasure for us to be here. Uh, we, uh, in preparation for this, we, we haven't scripted it at all, but we've had a, a couple of meetings when we talked about what we might talk about, which would interest a, a completely unknown, diverse audience. And so we know we're not going to run out of things to say. We might well run out of time. Very much so. I mean, sort of picking up on, on what Alison was saying, that engineers are needed all over the place for a variety of different activities. Um, and in the UK especially, we're, we're facing an engineering shortage. Um, and one of those questions is, how do you get people into engineering? Um, specifically, you know, how do you get more women into engineering? The UK is, is shockingly low in the number of, of women studying engineering and doing engineering, although it is rising, um, according to the Royal Academy of Engineering. And, and also uh, people from a diverse range of backgrounds. And I think it's always interesting to find out, you know, women who are successful in engineering or who have who've had a career in that, how they even thought about it or how did they find out or how did they get into it? I mean, yourself, Claire, how, what made you decide to become an engineer? Well, at school, I was always interested in the, the, the physical sciences, how things worked. Uh, but it had never crossed my mind to do engineering. And so I was interested in material science. That was the bit of physics, which it turned out uh, you know, it fulfilled all the things that I was um, most keen on. And so I uh, applied to Cambridge uh, and went to Girton, read material science. Not engineering. Not engineering at all. <laughs> and at Girton, um, you know, this was a long time ago, and there weren't that many women around. One of the first years was an engineer, and she was one of three women engineers in her year. Uh, and that was the first time that I'd met a knowingly an engineering student, female. And so I, I did natural sciences and material science, which is it's actually part of engineering. But it wasn't until um, I was, as a postdoc, I uh, spent time in the engineering department working with um, Jim Woodhouse on violins, which is a, a research topic which I've been um, following as a sort of part-time activity, and sort of got drawn into the engineering department at that stage. So that, that was how it happened. Yeah, so quite a change from materials into mm. violins into all kinds of different things. Mm. And, I, and what about you? I think for myself it was a slightly different scenario. I, I uh, grew up with 
to Sri Lankan parents um, who left Sri Lanka during the civil war years. One was a medic, one was an engineer. Um, so I was always aware of that engineering existed. Um, and what I really liked about what both my parents did was that both of them did something that made a difference. My mother's doctor my, and my dad, you could see, especially you know, in Sri Lanka, where those kinds of things made a really big impact. Uh, things like being able to provide electricity, being able to provide transport, rail, road, all these kinds of things, clean water. And you could see the impact of what engineers had. And that's pretty much what motivated me to become a civil engineer in the end. Uh, and I think by the time I, I got to Cambridge, um, I was at Sydney Sussex in my undergrad, and I think the engineering department by that time was about 20% engineers, which is still low, but <laughs> quite a different dynamic. And, and I imagine, yeah, studying engineering, well, in your case, material science in the, in the 70s was quite different. What was, what was Cambridge like back then? Well, there were about 10% women undergraduates, so it was very different. Um, I think um, blokes tended to go off to the Homerton Nursing School to find female company. And so uh, women in, were in demand, but yeah. that didn't actually uh, worry me too much. I had my circle of friends and there was, I, I did music along, uh, as a spare time activity alongside um, you know, the, the physics society I was quite involved in. Um, so, I mean, it, it was a, a very different sort of world, but uh, I, I was at Girton, and so we cycled in down the Huntingdon Road. I had friends at Newnham, and we, we, um, we, I won't say we looked down on them, but we did look something askance at them, because, of course, you know, cycling in on the Huntingdon Road, it was quite chilly, and we all wore trousers, and the Newnham girls, they wore skirts. <laughs> <laughs> quite different times. Yeah. yeah. So after my undergraduate, I, I went straight on to do a PhD in material science, and I was in a, a research group, and you know, I enjoy working with people. And so, you know, the collaborative research has always been very important to me. And so it, it was a, a very good research group. Um, I was doing transmission electron microscopy. I had a year out between school and university working at the National Physical Laboratory and was actually you know, doing transmission electron microscopy. And so I'd learned a lot of skills and techniques, which I used in my final year project as a um, undergraduate. So just as in case people don't know, what is that topic about? What is? So transmission electron microscopes, they're sort of huge things um, used for looking at very small things. <laughs> yes. You know, the bigger the instrument, the smaller you think <laughs> you, you, you look at. And so, you know, in, in, that, in those days, um, it, it, experimentally very heavy, you know, mm. preparing the specimens and actually working the microscopes. Um, they're all you know, computer controlled now, but uh, there was still quite a lot of development going on at that stage. And so it was, it was very manual. And you know, actually, I ended up looking after one of the transmission microscopes, uh, doing the technician job on it and the training, as well as operating the microscope. That was my microscope. <laughs> so in the research group, uh, it was a big group. and. Uh, people had sort of got out of the habit of writing up and moving on. And so when I joined the group, I decided that I was going to finish my PhD in three years and yep. you know, be ready to move on. I did it in three years and ten days. But in the whole of that time, nobody else actually wrote up. Yes. <laughs> And so um, yeah, I was actually sponsored by a National Physical Laboratory and so you know, went off down there. And I had a major row with them after about six months mm -hmm. when I started getting results which they didn't like, and didn't believe. I was right, of course. Right, and at this stage, <laughs> at this stage you're, you're relatively young, early on in your career, six months into a PhD in your 20s, presumably. How do you, how do you go about resolving that kind of tension? <laughs> um, I just uh, ig ignored the people who were being difficult and worked with the people who were being less difficult. And you know, the Cambridge group, it was very supportive. I'm, with the electron microscopy, 
you take photographs mm -hmm. and you'd you know, develop them all yourself and lay them out in the light box to see what you've got. So I'd lay out the photographs. And all these bored people who weren't writing up their PhDs would come around and have a look. <laughs> And you know, they're actually quite brutal because you, know, you take the photographs and then until you look at them, you don't know what you've got. Oh, and so days. there'll be people who are saying, what did you take that one for? <laughs> what else is going on here? So you, know, they, they, um, you learnt a lot and they were all very helpful and supportive and said, oh, come on, I'll show you how to do that properly. Mm -hmm. So standards were extremely high. And so, you know, we knew that we were in one of the best groups in the world and so had no doubts about that. But um, you learn to stand up for yourself quite a lot. Yes. Yeah. No, I think, I think similarly for me, that's a lesson I, I've yeah. learned as well along yeah. the way. Um, so I obviously studied engineering here um, and then moved in, into industry. But um, having worked in, in both civil engineering, both as a designer and, and in construction, you find that actually like, there are a lot of challenges you will face from people who either believe that you shouldn't be doing that, you are too young to do that, you are, I don't know, not the right person to do it without really knowing anything about you or your background. Um, and that, I think that is one of the, the challenges that remains in engineering, that although we still pour lots of attention into inspiring young women, getting them here, places like Newnham and, and actually the civil engineering department and the engineering department in general are wonderful places. Um, that have a, a great like facilities and encourage people to take up hobbies, do engineering, all these great kind of things. But then the problem comes is that then you pour all these people into the workforce and then you've got these kind of environments that don't necessarily support those people in flourishing. Um, and one of the things I also similarly learned quite early is that you will have to stand up for yourself. And I think there's always this, I don't know, when I was younger, I always thought, you know, like, you just do what everyone else does and you will kind of grow in your career path and then you hit an obstacle. In my case, I, I, I ended up in some quite terrible situations around sexual harassment, around uh, people who wouldn't let me attend meetings. So I thought I just wasn't the right person, all these kinds of things that were kind of career blockers to me. Um, but like you said, similarly to you, I think one of those things is finding out, don't just get too kind of down, okay, this person doesn't like me. There are plenty of people in the world who will not like you, but there are also other people who will back you, support you, encourage you, and give you further opportunities. And I think, I think the engineering career is about those who can kind of open your eyes and look for the right opportunities, because we all need slightly different ones, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, and I mean, you're, yourself, you've kind of had this long uh, career and, and ended up in several senior positions within Cambridge. I mean, that must have been both challenging and, and interesting. How, how do you... How do you engineer a career into being a successful person? <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I actually, I mean, it's time that we heard from you a bit more, <laughs> but we'll come back to that if we remember. Sure, just sure. A moment. But I mean, immediately post-graduation, what happened to you? Because you went off and did some rather curious and exciting things. Yeah, so that was the other thing. When I was younger, I, I, like I said, I assumed that there was a career path and you knew it and you just follow these steps and step by step by step. I, I, in my head, I had envisaged myself as kind of becoming a technical director in a, in a civil engineering design company. That's what I thought I would do. Um, but the path is a little bit winding and it, it, in the end, you can, you can have your career, but life also has to fit into, into that puzzle as well. So for me, I, uh, as I said, studied engineering, um, but I knew that when I graduated, I would be moving to Spain. Um, and specifically, I would be moving to Spain in a very difficult time. I have a, a younger sister um, uh, with quite a severe physical disability, but who is extremely bright. Um, and so she had been given a, a year abroad in Spain for her own degree course, and we decided we would move together um, so I could give her a bit of support. Now, I did my engineering degree uh, at a time in 2006 when there were loads of jobs and everyone was saying, what a great career, lots to do, lots of jobs, great prospects. And then obviously in 2009, the, the economic crisis hit. And so then everyone's jobs were gone um, and it was a very difficult time in the UK. Spain was worse. Spain was something like 26% uh, general unemployment, uh, nearly 50% unemployment for under 25. So the, the situation was pretty dire. Um, but like I said, I knew I was going there. And so when I was in the engineering department, I took advantage of things like uh, there were free language courses. Um, and so I, I took a technical Spanish course. Um, and then um, actually this festival is part of the, the alumni festival. And actually, what I did was I contacted the alumni network and said, 
anybody living in Spain, anyone who'd be able to show me around and, and you know, and, and so I met someone named Charlotte who was working uh, for a company in Spain and who actually ended up offering me an interview for a job, but uh, the, the commute was too long. But um, anyway, my sister and I moved out to Spain and as we said, the, the job situation was quite tricky. Um, and so my first job was actually as a, a translator of engineering patents between Spanish and English. So I learned a lot about what cool things other people were inventing, um, but not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the one <laughs> doing the engineering um, and eventually managed to find a, a very poorly paid but job uh, within an, an engineering design consultancy in Spain. Um, before uh, eventually realizing that the opportunities were, were much better for me in the UK. Coming back to the UK, worked in industry for a while, and then this, this great uh, opportunity came up in the midst of my, my struggles in that company, where someone said, we've got a PhD opening at Cambridge, why don't you do that? Um, and so uh, somebody said, you could do that, and I said, yes, but there's one problem. I'm now quite old. <laughs> I have things like a mortgage and things to pay for and that's not really an option. And, and so rather than turn that down, I, I just basically went and asked around like to my company, you know, could I do something that would be valuable and useful and, and perhaps you could sponsor some of the additional wage difference. And so basically engineered an opportunity that would allow me to do the PhD a little bit later in life. Um, and then ended up here in this fabulous position uh, working on my own research at Nuno. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm. So um, my career, I'm just you know, thinking back on it, um, it, it's been pretty random, really. Uh, it hasn't, I haven't had an you know, overall goal that I wanted to aim for. I felt like one of those balls on a you know, pinball machine which ricochets around. Um, but I think for both of us, you know, taking opportunities has been one of the things that you know, we've enjoyed mm -hmm. and being open-minded and you've already said something about you know, engineering the opportunities so you know doing the homework the bit of preparation just you know, positioning yourself so that if opportunities come up then you can grasp them but I'm um, looking back and I, I guess I've been working for, for you know, 40 ish years and it roughly divides into 10-year blocks okay. So the, the first 10 years I was in you know, material science, you know, this is you know, engineering approximations here, um, basically doing research. But uh, I got a Newnham Research Fellowship. And so I was involved in um, Newnham students, natural scientists at that time. So I, I was doing a lot of supervising in materials, got to learn lots of students. You know, basically, I was doing you know, research and you know, a bit of teaching and you know, I, I like meddling with things, so I've always been involved with a bit of administration. And she uh, love to tinker, don't they? <laughs> yeah. And I like making things happen. Yes. And then uh, one of the things that I got involved with was this violin research. And actually, that was a Newnham thing. So Newnham, you go into lunch as a senior member and you sit down at the table and people come and sit next to you. And Mary Archer was a fellow at that time, and she came and sat next to me and said, well, um, I've got this um, interesting uh, violin maker in Cambridge who's got some theories about the, uh, the secret of Stradivari and wants some investigative research done. Can you think of anybody who might like to do that? And I said, yes, me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, that got me into this you know, very curious violin-making, restoring world, which is full of interesting characters. <laughs> and, you know, it requires a lot of um, communication across disciplines to get m messages over. And, you know, as a scientist going into that, you have people who are completely unscientific in some cases and uh, need to... Um, first reassure them that you respect what it is that they're doing, um, but then also find ways to work with them. So that was a whole load of fun, and it was uh, through that I met Jim Woodhouse, who does the acoustics side, and so I, I was doing the materials, he was doing the acoustics, and that was how I moved into the engineering department. So the department tea room at that time was where you met people, and so... Um, I met Mike Ashby there, 
who's you know, one of the really the heroes in my field of material science. And he learned about what I was doing and uh, invited me to um, a postdoc in his group working on cork, actually, mm. recycled cork. <laughs> <laughs> and so I moved into engineering department and um, again continued with lots of research. And so centre of gravity, um, somewhere between engineering and Newnham, but when I moved into engineering, I, I took over as director of studies because um, Penny Probert, who'd been directing studies, she was the, the first engineer as director of studies. She was moving over to Oxford, and so I took over from her. And so I um, sort of started my, working my way into the department, um, started lecturing. Um, I, I was interested in, in doing more teaching. And... Um, you know, Mike Ashby is a wonderful person, but um, not very good at um, perhaps you know, seeing the opportunities which people needed outside the research area. And I, I, so, as um, in your own professional, you know, yes, yeah. yes. And so the, the, the teaching side, I remember talking with the, the head of division, David Newland, who was a you know, wonderful mentor and. and and very um, helpful with personal development. And so we agreed that I should do some lecturing. But oh dear, you know, they just organised all the lecturing for the following year, so you know, next year. And the next year came round and I, I realised that the same thing was going to happen again. So I went up to his office and his very helpful secretary was there and I explained mm -hmm. my problem. Oh, she said, well, we've got these lists on the table here. Why don't you just write your name on the <laughs> list? <laughs> so, so I did that, and then the lecturing just happened. Yes. And so then I got more involved in, in the lecturing. So the, those first 20 years, I was very research-focused and you know, all the, you know, invited talks and papers and stuff like that. I was never very keen on writing the research grants, <laughs> and, but I enjoyed the research. Uh, then I, I got a, a lectureship in the um, manufacturing division. And um, so that was physically separate from the engineering department in, in Mill Lane. Mm -hmm. And a very different ethos there. Yeah. So um, they, they'd you know, developed the, the MET course, Manufacturing Engineering Tripos. And uh, they had their own ways of working. and. Um, there was a, a bit of, no, there was a lot of friction between them and the main engineering department. Mm -hmm. And so my moving there you know, from engineering to MET, um, you know, I could see quite a lot of the things that could be done better. Yeah. And so, of course, my meddling instincts came to the fore there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, within a year of joining that, I... Um, taken over as course director for the manufacturing engineering tripos, so that that did rather take me away from the research side. I managed to you know, keep things going, and so for the next ten years, I was very involved with um, kicking the manufacturing tripos into shape and you know, keeping the best bits of it. And, and how did you do that in a way that didn't? ruffle mm. feathers because especially in, 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 in big institutions old institutions have been there quite a long time that is the thing that's seen like no no you've just come here what do you know about the way and it's like, i find that in, in construction engineering in general there is always this perception that this is the way we've always done it but it's not necessarily either the best way or the most sustainable way or, or whatever it may be how, how do you do yeah. that <laughs> and that of course is the key isn't yes. it yes so a lot of quiet conversations with individuals spot the difficult individuals and talk with them, find out what their problems are mm -hmm. and try to find ways to make them feel that um, they've had all these good ideas themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, when it comes to the, the, the meetings, when decisions are made, then it's their ideas, dear, so that's absolutely fine. Yes, no, no, but, quite. There's, there's yeah. something about... <laughs> also. The, the people part of engineering that people don't think about very often, because I think engineering is very, 
it's, it's perceived as a very technical subject. You do lots of calculations, there's a bit of physics, and, and ta-da, there's a solution. Um, and I mean, in, in my side of things, in, in civil engineering, you see where that goes wrong in, in like cities where people have done the calculations, they've done it to cut, but it practically doesn't work for the people or the humans that need to use the particular building or, or urban design that's, that's taken place. Um, and I mean, in, in your kind of field, that, that kind of discussion about people and things like that, it's, it's about, yeah, getting the right people on board. And I think I remember you once told me a story that uh, about man because I, I think I've had a few instances and actually talking about people that support Claire is one of the people that supports me. Um, and so I remember getting into quite a difficult discussion with someone who um, had thought, you know, just straight after finishing my PhD that I shouldn't be allowed to teach similarly. Um, but I remember you told me quite an interesting story that I was wondering if you would share about, uh, about how to get around these kinds of difficult characters. Yes, that, that, that was a, a very difficult time for me. So, you know, PhD went fine, yep. you know, got over the problems with the <laughs> sponsor and they came round in the end and that was all right. But post PhD, setting up um, in my own right as a researcher, mm -hmm. there's a very difficult transition. So. I remained in the same research group. And so my PhD supervisor, then we needed to change the dynamics of the role a bit, so that I was then working independently. And it did not go very well. Mm -hmm. And so there were really quite difficult tensions in the group. And uh, he ended up really quite unable to cope with talking to me which I didn't enjoy, but the rest of the research group, they also didn't enjoy it. So it was, mm -hmm. it was causing tensions all round. And so after uh, some time of this, I thought, you know, actually, you know, we can't be doing with this. And so what I did was to invite him and his wife and the whole research group to dinner at my house. So you know, he, he couldn't refuse and his <laughs> wife was there. And the whole research group was there. He, he couldn't not talk to me, having been actually blanking me for quite some time. And after that, you know, we were able to get onto uh, at least a, a courteous footing and things improved. But, but that, that was a, a, a very difficult time. And so I you know, grasped the nettle or whatever it is that you do to just make things happen. And so that was a, a useful lesson, I think, that you, you, can, you can make things happen, you can turn things around, but you perhaps have to be a bit bold. So yes, a combination of subtle manoeuvres and facing the problem directly, which I think is just something you sort of gain experience in over time. It's quite a hard thing to teach people that in an undergraduate degree, for example, those are life skills you build along the way. Mm. Yeah. Um, but in the manufacturing tripos, the students go out and do projects in industry. And you know, we teach him all this technical stuff and the first project is full of technical stuff and they, they do it and they do their presentation at the end of the project and you know, with any luck the company is pleased. And about the second project, they come back after the first week and they say, you know, it's not the technical stuff, <laughs> it's the people. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the really difficult bits. Yeah, no, I, I had a similar thing, actually, thinking back to my own undergraduate degree. Um, in, in the fourth year in engineering, you do a master's project. And I had decided, OK, if I need to spend 50% of my time working on something, I want to work on something that I really enjoy. Um, so knowing that also I was going to Spain the next year, I thought, OK, I'll do a project that relates to practicing Spanish, but also technically quite interesting for me as a civil engineer. Um, in my undergraduate, I spent a lot of time doing work with engineers without borders. Um, it kind of brought me with a group of, of like-minded people that I really enjoyed. And I, I encountered an organization called Practical Action, um, or ITG, ITDG in Latin America, um, who were interested in doing some, so a little bit of research around some of the structures that were failing for them. Um, and so I ended up doing this project in uh, basically the Andes in Latin America. I'd, I'd managed to get out of doing my, my summer placement. So I, I had a Quest scholarship from the Institution of Civil Engineers, which obliged me to work every summer for an engineering company. Um, but again, it was the, near the recession time. And so I took advantage. I said, you really don't want me on your payroll, do you? <laughs> and they were like, 
well, if you want to go do something else, like go to Latin America instead, please do. And I said, great. Um, and so I did. And then basically I was, I was working with them looking at uh, micro hydro electric schemes. So these are um, schemes where there's water in the mountains and they divert a little bit of it. it they drive it down a hill, drives a turbine, generates electricity. Um, and this is private electricity for quite remote villages, the kinds of villages where uh, in the wintertime the floods come in and they're inaccessible. They're really, really remote places. But, you know, the electricity can provide lighting for, you know, evening studies, they can provide lighting for vaccines, all this kind of stuff. And so they wanted to know why some of their channels were breaking, why some of their stuff was failing, all this kind of stuff. And they said, here are all of our design calcs, here's all this stuff. So again, launched into the technical stuff. Um, only to find later that actually it wasn't the technical stuff that was the problem. There were two key issues why they were having problems with their structures. One was that, you know, they decided to make things out of uh, reinforced concrete and all this sort of stuff, ignoring that historically in that area there wasn't a lot of people doing those kinds of structures, and so there wasn't a lot of knowledge in how to build those kinds of structures, and so you had unskilled people, you know, making them. Um, and so in addition to not having money to put sufficient reinforcement and things like that that you needed, you had um, concrete, if you don't know, um, becomes more workable if you add water. It also reduces the strength if you added a lot of water. So people were chucking in water to make it easier to construct, not realizing the fault that they were, they were, the, they were inherently uh, weakening the structure. The other one I learned was that um, there was various slope failures. And it had nothing to do with the engineering, nothing to do with the calx. What they had done was basically built these channels in farmland and kind of negotiated access from farmers. And these farmers obviously wanted to irrigate their land. And so they were putting a lot of water and the slope failed. And so none of these things were a question of the calculations. It was all about the people using the structures, which I found quite interesting as a conclusion um, and quite an <laughs> interesting project for a fourth year engineer. Mm. Yeah. So coming back to my career, so I, I you know, did MET for about 10 years yeah. and took over the, the course, chairman of the subject group. So you know, basically I was running the show. Yeah. And of course everybody else gets very lazy. Oh, Claire will do it. <laughs> so uh, after about 10 years, I, I took some sabbaticals, so I had to stop everything and that caused major panic because nobody, <laughs> nobody knew how to do anything so you know I needed to get out at that stage. So I had a year's sabbatical and I was in the tea room in the engineering department and Mary Wilby in the teaching office came up, tapped me on the shoulder and said how about moving down here Director of Undergraduate Education? I said, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> um, and then uh, Hugh Shercliffe said, how about taking over from me as Director of Undergraduate? And so I could see this was a pincer move movement. <laughs> and so it was inevitable that I did that. So I moved you know, from manufacturing back to, back to the engineering department. Um, it was billed as a 30% role, but you know, 30% of a full-time academic job means actually <laughs> nothing at all, so yes. I was quite involved with that. And um, that was interesting. Um, there were aspects of the job that I enjoyed, but there were aspects that I absolutely didn't enjoy. Um, it, it's very bitty, and there are things that you, know, you, you are told to do, and I'm not at all good at doing things that I am told to do. <laughs> It has to be on my on my own um, basis, really. Yes. Um, and, you know, thinking back in the things that I've in, enjoyed, you know, my part two project that was really the only bit of my undergraduate career that I thoroughly enjoyed, mm -hmm. because that was you know, my own design and on my own basis. Yes. So the the director of undergraduate edu education job, you know, learnt a lot. That was fine. You know, I like to keep busy, and uh, I was certainly busy. And, and then you know, towards the, the end of my um, three-year stint of that, um, the, the other academic in the teaching office, the, um, the deputy head role, which is you know, billed as more of a, a full-time role, mm -hmm. he was due to move on, and he was looking at finding his successor, because 
um, you know, you, you, you do stack the odds um, by trying to find somebody that you think is going to be able to do the yes. job that you approve of. And so he started to talk about this, and I said, well, who have you got in mind? And he mentioned a few names. And I thought, well, first thing, I, I don't want to work with any of those people. <laughs> but also, actually, I could do better than them. Mm -hmm. So I, I um, having thought about it, I, I wandered over the corridor and said, um, I'd, be, I'd be quite interested. And he said, oh, oh, um, well, I... I I suppose perhaps you could do it. I think there would be things you'd find very difficult. But yeah, it's OK, all right. And so um, actually other people you know, thought rather more highly of my ability to do the job, and so I ended up doing it. Yes. Moved into that, and I really, really enjoyed that. You know, that's high enough up the tree that um, there weren't people telling me what to do. I know, and you have some influence way. over the entire institution at that level. Uh, it certainly did. And uh, David Cardwell was head of department at that time, and you know, his attitude to you know, people that he trusted was um, hand over the job, and okay, that's that's your patch. I'm there to support, but he didn't meddle, mm -hmm. and so I had an awful lot of freedom in what I did, and and was able to you know, concentrate on the aspects that I thought I could do best. Um, everybody does this. You know, so it's a monstrous job. So you do focus on particular bits that um, actually play to your strengths. So I really enjoyed it. Had a, a lovely time meddling in all manner of things in the department, in the university. And I hope that I you know, left a reasonable legacy there. But uh, you know, partway through my time, uh, Dave Cardwell got headhunted to be a pro vice chancellor. So he, he told me um, that this was going to happen and that we, there would need to be a, you know, we'd need to set things in motion for getting his successor in the department. But, so there would have to be an interim head. But we all knew who the interim head was going to be, and so that was fine, no problem. Um, until the person that we were all knowing was going to do the job said, um, actually, no. <laughs> And so th then, you know, we had other people lined up, yeah, but they, they all said no. And it was actually a slightly difficult time in the, the department then. There were some HR issues. Mm -hmm. And so you know, there were rather a lot of tensions around. And um, my, my husband had said, you know, this, uh, this head of department job, you're not going to do it, are you? And I said, no, absolutely no way. <laughs> So uh, this, the interim head, um, after a bit, one of the you know, top people in this, in this group um, came and said to me, now look, I think actually you need to do it. And so I said, uh, okay, well, you know, <laughs> let me sleep on it. And um, I, I could see actually that with nobody willing to do it, I was probably the, the only person who could take it on. Mm -hmm. And so I said yes, and you know people heard about it, and that was fine. One of the um, the, you know, the, the the management team hadn't heard about it on on the grapevine, and so he came along and said, um, "So what's happening about the interim head? Have they got somebody?" And I said yes, and he said, "Who?" I said, "Me." And he picked his jaw up off the floor and said, um, uh, well, I suppose that will be all right as long as you don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, there's quite a lot in that. So um, I, I did laugh inwardly. Yes. I thought, OK, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, not doing things was a very important part of you know, trying to calm down the department situation. Mm -hmm. So rather than responding immediately to things that came along, I would just let them go quiet and then give a considered response. Yes. And you know, I, I cancelled an awful lot of committees <laughs> and was able to just 
um, get things back onto an even keel. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was supposed to be a two-month period yes. over the summer when I uh, agreed to take it on. Nice quiet it, time. That's right. It turned into three months and so started before mm -hmm. we'd expected. But then there was a, a delay in the new head of department taking over and so it was going to extend into the Michaelmas term. And that really was um, rather exciting because I, I, um, I managed to you know, pass on a lot of the Newnham stuff to our wonderful team of senior members here. Yes. But the deputy head role in the department, um, I couldn't hand that on, I handed on bits of it, but I needed to do that job as well. Mm -hmm. And so I was head of department and deputy head, and it was completely insane. <laughs> And that, that two-month period is the most intense that I have ever had. You know, I, I worked hard before, and I, I yes. knew that you know, I could, could work hard, and I thought I was working at capacity. But I discovered that um, that wasn't quite true, and I had a bit more capacity. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I just about got through to the end of term. I'd been monitoring my progress running down, got through to the end of term. That little extra factor of safety yeah. and energy, energy levels, yeah. <laughs> Yes, and you know, I was just enormously thankful that I got there without major disaster. I have never sailed so close to the wind. So very exciting, very fulfilling, and very nice to get to the end of term and to stop doing an awful lot of things and just going back <coughs> to the deputy head job, which was a complete doddle by comparison. <laughs> of course. Actually, lis listening to that kind of story, there's, there's two questions or two things that come to mind. I mean, I think... When you explain these stories, you're like, this, these things kind of happened, all this sort of thing. But it sounds like, you know, anyone moving into such a senior position in, the, in your career, like, it's obviously quite stressful, be it the people or the amount of work or whatever it is. Like, how, how do you cope with that kind of level of pressure in a career as you kind of mm. move up the ranks? What do, you, what do you do? And then my other kind of question would be around um, this idea that, when you're younger, you're expected to do it all, right? To, you know, balance both your personal life. In, in the case of academics particularly, there's teaching, there's management, there's your students, there's your own academic research and things like that. Um, but in reality, I, I don't think it's a realistic expectation. So how do you kind of deal with that giant pile of <laughs> things to do? <laughs> well, two questions at once is very difficult. So I mean, on the, um, the support and switching off, bit. Um, you know, in that Michaelmas term, uh, it was particularly important to take downtime. So I would take you know, a day off at each weekend, mm -hmm. know, absolutely nothing. Otherwise, I knew that I couldn't survive. Burn out. But in general, having a support network of people that you can offload to, things where you, you know, have actually got relaxation. For me, you know, playing music is something I, I can't concentrate on anything except the music that I'm playing. And, string you know, instruments, I guess? String instruments, yes. you know, <laughs> violin, viola, um, and you know, walking, cycling. So um, switching off activities and, and the support network, my trusted band of people who provide you know, particular you know, skills and perspectives that help you to just reorient. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, on the, the career planning bit and you know, balancing the teaching, research, home life, um, other activities. Act uh, yes. Um, I don't think I've done that particularly well, <laughs> but I have had a lot of fun. Yes. And you know, what I've done has been determined by looks interesting, think it plays to my skills, is give it a go and you know, actually to hell with what it might do to my career. But that's not a recipe for huge success in today's world, perhaps. But turn those questions back to you. Yes. Two questions, can you? Yes. <laughs> no, no, I mean, but also, I mean, you're talking about recipe in today's world, but I think the other thing to realise is that we're talking right at the beginning of this conversation that the, about a diverse range of people. I think different paths and different mixtures of those things will suit different people. So. I often get asked by, by undergraduates, like, how do you do this, that, and the other? And I'm, well, there isn't really a right answer here. You need to work out what works best for you, your own circumstance, your own situation. 
In terms of the questions, um, similar to you, I think in, in high stress situations, it really helps to have that support network. Um, and for me, I have, I have good friends, um, which has been a bit of a struggle more recently, as a lot of my friends live <laughs> internationally these days. Um, so a lot isn't, of isn't Zoom wonderful? Zoom is wonderful <laughs> to, to see them all. I do miss them. Um, and then also, I, I, I grew up in a very um, close South Asian family, and there is a lot of us, and we're, we're all very close, my, my partner and my family. Um, and I think I rely quite heavily on them. Um, my, my mother, <laughs> particularly, doesn't like work outside of work. Um, she, she works as a medic, so she likes to leave her work at the hospital. And so, you know, time when the family's enforced, like, no, you relax, this is your time to relax. Um, and friends, and then professionally, as I've kind of hinted to along the conversation, there are several people I, I go to when I'm struggling or I don't know how to deal with the situation yourself. Um, uh, I'm particularly close to the fellows at Sydney Sussex College still, the, the three of them there that support me quite a bit. Um, and then I also have industry mentors as well who, you know, help me understand what my strengths are and how to navigate around some of these very difficult characters and situations you find as you move further and further up. Because as you move further and further up the career ladder, as you've kind of mentioned yourself, there's always people that don't like the idea of you doing that job when, you, when you're fully capable of doing it. Um, and in terms of the balance, again, I'm not sure I'm, I've quite got it right, still a work in progress. Um, but similar to you, I, I actually I really like music. Um, I play the flute myself. And I'm quite active, like my partner and I, we like walking and hiking and all that kind of things. And, and yeah, just getting that, that balanced before you burn. It's, I think it's a lot easier to maintain yourself rather than recover from a burnout. And I think that's, I think that's becoming quite well recognized in, in this, especially kind of during the pandemic time. That a lot of people have realized actually their own personal welfare is quite important. Um, in a way that even like in, in civil engineering and construction, when I first started, you didn't have these kinds of attitudes. You just kept going and kept going. Whereas now there, there is health checks, there's safety checks, but there's also welfare checks. Actually, one of the biggest causes of, of death in construction, if you, if you can believe it, is actually suicide. Um, and so people have kind of realized that actually we need to take care of ourselves as well as the, the kind of professional technical work we do, which I thought was quite mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. What are you doing now, research-wise? Yeah, on the, on the topic of twists and turns, um, as I mentioned, I, I studied uh, engineering and specialised as a civil engineer and, and worked in, in the profession for several years. When I came back, I, I decided one of my frustrations with the construction industry is this idea that we love to do things the same way we've done, like forever. For like, we've done it 30 years, why would you change? And so I got increasingly frustrated that there was all this kind of interesting technological stuff happening, but we were not seeing it in my industry. And then I joined um, the engineering department and was working with um, the Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, um, led by a wonderful uh, professional, Jennifer Schooling, here. And, and her group works on um, you know, instrumentation, monitoring, digitising the construction sector so that we can understand you know, how things are behaving, performance, all this kind of stuff. My own personal passion as well was, was also combining that with this idea that you know, the impact of climate change is being felt, um, even on infrastructure. So, you know, the more floods you have, the more bridges get washed away. As things get hotter and colder, you know, you throw salt on, on roads and that corrodes um, transport structures faster. And so climate change is, is going to really start impacting our, our built environment as well. Um, and so I was quite interested in understanding how we could understand and mitigate that. Um, and so in a bizarre twist, I ended up doing a PhD in satellite monitoring. So lots of image processing, <laughs> lots of uh, data analysis. Um, and because I'd done the undergraduate degree here, I had a, a basis of knowledge across quite a few different subjects. I wasn't an image processing expert, but um, like most Cambridge engineers, I love to learn. And, uh, and so I didn't find the right level of skill for what I needed to do here. Um, and so I, I, through one of my contacts in the engineering department, ended up uh, speaking to someone at the German Space Agency and ended up going to Germany for a year, training there, understanding like how to, to properly process this type of, uh, I was looking at particularly radar imagery. Um, and with radar imagery, you can measure millime millimeters of movement uh, from, from like a kilometer or a few kilometers up in space and that kind of stuff. It was quite interesting. You can uh, monitor changes in, in like before and after flood events. Um, you can monitor, you know, the difference before and after an earthquake and you can kind of see the impact of what's happening on quite a big scale. Um, and so it was, a, it was a bit of a, a twist and turn, but then being able to combine that with my, you know, 
years of experience in, as, a, as a chartered civil engineer meant that I was kind of working in a, in a, a kind of chasm between two fields, um, which for me yielded some really interesting results because you're, you're working to basically communicate between two very mm -hmm. different groups mm -hmm. of people. One who thinks that, you know, we're optimizing for this because it's exciting. One who thinks that, okay, well, we do this and we don't really understand what you do over here. And being able to communicate between those two disciplines was, was pretty key. <laughs> no, it is very interesting, isn't it? And I've also been in, a, in that, that, that's, that's the, the niche that I like inhabiting. Yes. But uh, trying to translate between the two different fields is fascinating. Yes. Mm. I mean, for yourself, like for, for me, I think the, the struggle at the moment is also trying to balance the, the interesting side of research and then the, the frustrating side of research for me is often seeing the really exciting things not being translated into industry. Um, and so in, in my case in particular, I, I still do quite a lot of like applied based research, do a lot of collaborations with industrial partners and, and organizations. Um, and one of the things I ended up doing um, as part of my Isaac Newton fellowship was, was setting up a small company that could actually translate some of that uh, analysis that we do in the department into something that could be used as a product by, by people in industry. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really know where my career is going to go and what's going to happen and all these kinds of things. Did you, did you kind of have a clear path? Is, is that what you, did you know that you wanted to become a deputy head of the engineering division? Is that oh, right absolutely not. No. <laughs> no. Um, and the sustainability has been something that I you know, really got interested in you know, from 20 or more years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so working with materials, so end of life materials. I've done a lot on uh, metal, plastics, paper, cork, um, yeah. so you know, specific products from um, end of life materials there. That's been interesting. And you know, the common thread for me running through that is the microstructure mechanical property mm -hmm. aspect. And uh, currently plastics are all the thing. And so I do quite a lot on plastics and spend quite a lot of time telling people that plastics are actually wonderful materials, but it's the end of life that we need to be worrying about. But yeah. we need to continue to use our plastics. Interesting. And so, I mean, as you said, the, the kind of feel of sustainable has been around for quite a while. Do you see, like, is there a growing interest in it? Are people kind of, okay, we, we understand sustainability and you're trying to tell people that we need to keep doing it. And do you, see it still, do you still see enthusiasm from like students coming in? What is where are we now in that kind of thing? Because I think we as engineers see that in one way, and then the global perspective is slightly different. Mm. Well, I mean, there's the crisis, climate change crisis, so students are very interested in that, mm -hmm. nearly all students, <laughs> and that's great. And so there's certainly increasing interest in, in what I've been doing. I mean, recycling, um, that was really a, a, a dirty word. It's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the boring end, recycling. Um, recycling plastics, plastics are just rubbish, mm -hmm. and so um, it, this is just solving a rubbish problem. But people increasingly have been becoming you know, interested in it as part of the circular economy. Yes. And so you know, these are valuable materials, let's do something proper with them. Yes. But there's a lot to be done there. But you know, I hope that you know, post-Covid that will now be coming back more strongly. Mm. Yeah. So something is I wanted to ask you, this, this Forbes thing, tell us about that. Yes, okay, very embarrassing. <laughs> um, I, was, I was listed as, as uh, on a Forbes list of 30 under 30 uh, back when I was under 30. Um, and one of the questions I often get asked is, how on earth did you get onto that list? Because it's quite an, an unusual thing. And at that time, it was the first list they'd put together for um, basically people working in industry in Europe. So it was the first European list. Um, and people say, oh, yeah, how did you get on that? In all honesty, to be completely honest, I have no idea. Um, someone at some point must have nominated me and I have gone around to every mentor I have being like, was it you? Was it you? Was it you? And then I asked my, my PhD supervisor, he's like, you're on a Forbes? Like, how much money do you have? And I was like, not the rich list, <laughs> to be clear. Um, you know my salary, it's not great. Um, 
But um, yeah, I, I, to this day, I don't know. But it, it's played a really important part in, in my career as well in that one, it, it opened me up to a group of people, like a lot of these people do enterprise and they've set up businesses and they've become very you know, successful in, in doing that. And so I was able to see, you know, there's a whole bunch of people in their 20s setting up businesses themselves and, and really working on things that, that they feel make an impact on society, um, which I, I wouldn't have thought I could do that young. Um, and so it was kind of inspiration on, and on that side, being around a kind of group of highly motivated individuals. Um, but on the other side, it, it's a little bit of a, recognition and so people thought okay so I had two things by this point you know I had a degree from Cambridge and I was on this list and so people thought okay I mean you can't be stupid um, <laughs> you must be able to do something quite well um, and and I mean it's not great to say but as a, as a female in this kind of career in an engineering career it's quite handy to have things like that I, I mean I often put things like I'm professionally qualified and I, I write that and a lot of people are like, why do you put your email signature with these like, qualifications? And I say, as a woman, and I look a little bit younger than I am, you kind of do. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a tricky line. Yeah. yeah. No, you, you do have to still, yes. don't you? It is, it is not a level playing field. Indeed. No, yeah. and, I, and I think the other thing I've learned is that often you try and follow the path of, say, for example, a, a middle-aged white man who is your mentor or whoever it may be. And you think, okay, if I just do that, I'll get to the same place. And it's not always true. Uh, um, and I think that especially as, as being a woman in, in engineering, you have to realize that fair or not, it's not going to be the same path. Um, but you do have other skills and other opportunities. And I think, Claire, you, in this conversation, you've hinted at like, okay, you know, they may not want to do the same things I do, but if I can make, it, make them think it was their idea, so be it. And if you can let them have the, that. Uh... Yeah. And I never make the tea either. <laughs> that, yeah. Same. So um, we're drawing to a close here, but you know, some final thoughts about you know, what messages would you like people to take home? And I think, you know, thinking of our, our students, yeah. the sorts of things that I would wish to say to them, have a go. Mm. You know, don't be afraid to make mistakes when you're in a supportive environment and be open-minded and you know, grasp opportunities, engineer your opportunities. Yes, on my side, um, I think I mentioned it at the beginning that it's great to get more people inspired into engineering, but I think those of us who are a little bit older need to remember that it's still not easy even if more women are entering at undergraduate level and that those people should have support. Um, I think in places like Noonan they do, they have a lovely support network. Um, don't be afraid to, to try something, it may not work. Take the opportunities in front of you and then finally one for I think parents is, is also just to realise that schools and parents have a huge impact on, on what children do whether they recognise it or not. Um, in my school, they never mentioned engineering as a mm -hmm. career. The only reason I did it was my parents. And I was very fortunate to have parents who, you know, they came from difficult upbringings. We didn't have any money when we were young, but they would always find money for educational opportunities and encourage that love of learning. And so I think if you, if you have that love of learning, it's, it's, you know, to not worry that things may not be going the right way. There's, as you said, a way of engineering your, yourself out of that situation. <laughs> It feels a real shame to be bringing this fascinating conversation to an end. So many takeaways. I mean, I'm very grateful to you both for your honesty about the difficult times in your career, because uh, people listening, um, we all have them, and sometimes it's easy to think you're the only one, so it's really helpful when people are honest about that. Um, a theme I hear often when I talk to alumni is the path to a successful career has lots of twists and turns, to use Sackley's um, analogy, or it's like a pinball machine, <laughs> to use Claire's. And, but also that sense of both being creative to make opportunities, but actually also taking them when they come along, and things that you, just being open to those possibilities. I love the importance of people skills. I mean, I think there's very few careers where that's, that's not important, um, and perhaps we don't spend enough time thinking about how we do that, how do we have strategies for dealing with difficult people, and just the importance of mentors and support networks and people you can really be yourself with. 
And then I love this um, engineer's instinct for meddling and tinkering to make things better. And we've certainly benefited from that um, in Claire's long career. And Sakthi has already said so much about what she's doing. So a huge, huge thank you to both of you. Um, thank you to everybody for listening. Um, this is being recorded, so there will be a YouTube uh, video of this to watch. Um, we'll put the link around so that we can listen again and you can share it with other people. So thank you and goodbye.